If you're not a baseball fan, hold on. Before this story's over, we may make you one, or at least make you a fan of the Queen of the Reds, the Cincinnati Reds. It wasn't too long ago when the Reds were quite literally in the red, and there was talk that after almost 120 years of being a major league city, Cincinnati might lose the franchise. The owners wanted to sell the team or move it or both. To a rich widow and Cincinnati native named Marge Schott, that was unthinkable. And when none of the local big boys raised a hand to save the team, she put her money where her civic pride was and made herself queen of the Reds. This is really what I like to feel as our Christmas gift to the people of the city of Cincinnati. And um, I hope they're as happy as I am. God, I think I'm going to cry. This is why women shouldn't be in anything, I guess. It was practically the night before Christmas, four years ago, you went and bought yourself a baseball team. Why? I just kept waiting for one of the guys to step up, and I waited and waited. And you know, around Christmas time, how women do, they go out and buy everything as they charge it, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that was, might have been one of the reasons. It was probably the worst business decision anybody could have ever made. Um, I bought it with my heart. It was, a, it was a decision of the heart. 60-year-old Margaret Univer Schott, a woman renowned for taking up hobbies and dropping them, really paid for this one. $12 million of her own money for a controlling interest in the Reds. Everybody wants to be a winner, you know. And I guess an ambition of every owner, I know it's my ambition, is to win a World Series um, so I can have one of those big rings like all the men in baseball have. Marge Schott can hardly plead poverty, a familiar complaint from rich ball club owners. She lives in a magnificent spread just outside Cincinnati, a south fork in the Midwest. She was a well-cared-for housefrau who knew zilch about business when, 20 years ago, her husband Charlie died. Charlie Schott ran a lot of companies. If he had left me some coupons to clip or department store, some would have been great. But he left really strange things, like <laughs> brick plants, uh, block plans, pig iron, um, unfinished shopping centers. I bluffed for about two years, you know. I wouldn't know what I was signing at the time, but I'd pick on little things, you know. How do they know? I didn't know. And um, when the accountants first uh, sat me down, I was so nervous that they showed me the financial statement, and I didn't know what to say. And I said, oh, well, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm a millionaire. They said, lady, you're looking at the debit side, not the asset side. You act your best when you know nothing, you know, because you don't know what can happen to you. Now I'm so smart, I'm scared of everything. The business that scared her most was Charlie Schott's GM dealership. When she took it over, her own managers tried to keep her out of the place. She had well, to I learn to be pushy. The she learned. For 129. Yeah, but I told him to put the advertise to find out what the price was if you order one. Okay, we'll do it. Why don't we do that? We'll get that, we'll okay. get that squared away. Okay. And everybody was gone last night when I called, too. For two years, she battled General Motors, who were uncomfortable with a woman, a widow, running a major dealership. She pulled every stunt in the book to sell cars. She presented new cars in her own living room. She used dogs to pitch cars. GM grudgingly saw the light. Some of this dumb woman in the car business was selling more cars than any other dealer in the tri-state area. She may not be so dumb. Under her ownership, the Reds have gone from a team deep in debt to a profitable winning club. It's more than a business. Kind of like inheriting, like, 42 sons all of a sudden, you know. I think I'm one of the few owners that can give the players a hug or a kiss, because if another owner did it, I'm sure there'd be some talk. Is that part of the kick, the, the kind of mother henning of these? Uh, I guess sort of, guys? you know. Um, and yet I've had criticism for that too. Whenever we trade somebody, you know, I always feel bad that the guy has to leave town and take his wife and children, and the paper said, well, that's ridiculous, you know. But again, that's a woman talking. The guy's a hero one day, and you're giving him a hug, and the next day you're having some man give him his walking papers. Yeah, that's the way it works. That's the way I'm going to do it. <laughs> yeah, I'll give them the hug and the men can give them the walking papers. Before you, you became the, 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 the grand dame, the queen of the reds, whatever, <laughs> uh, you were notorious for taking up hobbies and dropping them. 
Well, we were never blessed with children, and and I, uh, people are so blessed that they have children. I hope they realize that. But I felt guilty, you know, because my friends were all producing and I wasn't. So it was like I had to really have a project, you know, every year. All of Marge Schott's projects eat. There are the St. Bernards, once as many as 22, now just two. Then there was her honeybee period. We made great honey. Charlie figured those jars of honey cost about 500 bucks a piece. And then, uh, oh, and then I bought the, the steers. The steers, otherwise known as fixed bulls, but somehow one bull wasn't fixed enough, and Marge Schott's cow became pregnant. So a few animals for decorative purposes became a herd. And there's the zoo. She's probably the most important benefactor the Cincinnati Zoo has. Hanging out in a zoo may well be the best kind of training for her latest project, the ball club. Another project that eats, mainly it eats money. Who has, who has a ball? Oh, Mario, Mario. Who has a, has a catcher thing? Mario. Mario's got Mario's the, a pitcher. Yeah, and the catcher's right uh, in second place. He better be a pitcher. Last month, she moved the team into a new $5 million spring training complex in Plant City, Florida. Plant Cityans had heard all about Marge, but seeing her in action was something else again. You kids ready? Hot to try? You think I'm okay? Oh, yeah. Just nothing women can't do. We're showing them tonight. Thank you. And then there's that curious relationship between Marge and her player manager, Pete Edward Rose. Say something. <laughs> something. The same Pete Rose, a Cincinnati native who has an off-ramp named after him. Cincinnati in a worldwide television. The same Pete Rose who Marge brought back to Cincinnati to break Tykov's record for most hits in a lifetime. 2-1 pitch from Shaw. For in this town, Marge Schott may be the grand dame, but Pete Rose walks on water. He may be the only manager in baseball who the owner wouldn't dare fire. Could you do it? Could you fire? Probably not. I'd probably have to get a man to do it, you know? <laughs> the first year I took over, we went from last to second. But we've been there ever since. We've been there the three, uh, three straight years, which isn't that bad. Uh, but Marge says she's tired of being a bridesmaid, so we've got to do something about that. So we're, we, all we want is another wedding in Cincinnati. <laughs> That's all we want. A few years back, Rose talked Marge into buying an expensive pitcher named John Denny, whose arm later went bad. Now she must pay Denny about $400,000 not to play. And I said, well, can he do yard work or what? You know, and they looked at me like I was crazy. They said, no, you just send him home. And I thought, this is nuts. You know, maybe he could sell a car, do something. But they don't do it that way. You just send him home and send him the money. On the one hand, here you have Pete, this the Charlie Hustle of right. the big red machine. That's right. Uh, now he's in the position of having to kind of coddle guys who are earning a million bucks a year and uh, say, well, they're a little bit hurt and they don't want to play. I said, well, tell them to play anyway. He said, well, they could sue you. I said, I don't care. I said, I've got a better suggestion, Pete. I said, why don't we get a sign and get a room? put a sign up called the wimp room. And then when they can't, you just say, go in the wimp room. Well, we didn't do that, but I don't know if he thought, but that was my suggestion to him. She told me once she'd like to see a system of paying players in which they got so much for a single, so much for a double, so much for a uh, triple or home run. They lost so much for a strikeout. <laughs> Tell her forget about it. <laughs> it won't work. <laughs> How is she about money, about spending money on ball players? I think she's great. Uh, she might not be great about spending money on other things, but uh, hey, I'm the highest paid manager in the history of baseball, and we got a couple guys that make a million dollars, a couple guys that make close to a million. Uh, Marge is not a big shot during the game. She don't sit up in the air-conditioned boxes. You know, she sits right down, down there and eats peanuts and drinks beer and smokes cigarettes and, huh? and signs autographs during I'm the sure game, and uh, I just hope someday she don't get hit with a line drive when she's signing an autograph. When you really and that's the only thing I worry about. Okay, big boy, see ya.
On this particular afternoon, she sits with A. Bartlett Giamatti, who gave up the presidency of Yale University to become the president of baseball's National League. Listening to Marge may have given him some second thoughts. Should we throw the game for Morley? <laughs> no, no, Marge, we don't throw okay. the game, right. even for okay. CBS. We don't right. throw games, okay. Marge. Right. No, no, Marge, the okay. idea of throwing games is a nasty <laughs> bit of baseball. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is this a girl bat boy or a boy that needs a goddamn haircut? Well, Marge, it's a question you ought to take up with the young person itself. You got it. Is that a boy or a girl? It's a young right man with a modern well, haircut. He'll never be out here again with long hair sitting like that. All right. I'm serious. Hey, if my players what if don't a player, have long... What if a player wanted to grow a mustache or a beard he on can't, your team? He can't. What do you got against facial he hair can't. trimmed just, and neat? Hey, look. And, 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 I am for the clean. It's a tradition in Cincinnati. It's going to remain that way. No one in Cincinnati's ever had a mustache? No. Well, so years, much for maybe William Howard Taft. Maybe 100 years ago. Oh. I know you have one, boy, but that's okay. You're from Yale. Jesus. <laughs> Are you killing me? Take me out to the ball game. Take me out to the crowd. Clearly, she's getting the most out of the life she's been left to lead, even though it was never the life she really wanted. I've been very fortunate to have survived, let's put it that way. I think it's very frightening when you're suddenly left alone. It's even frightening today, you know. Uh, Rich uh, or poor, it's frightening. Rich or poor, it's, and, and I, particularly for a woman, the insecurity of it, you know. Uh, you're always worried, you know, something's going to happen to you because you don't have that big guy next to you to take care of you. So tomorrow afternoon, the Queen of the Reds will preside over another opening day, along with 52,000 of the faithful and the dog and the legend and those guys in the red and white uniforms We'll try for one more wedding in Cincinnati.